Hi, I'm Matt Ambrose with the Defense Acquisition University. And for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an overview of the operation of the Defense Acquisition System as it's described in the Department of Defense Instruction 5000.02, which is the regulation for how we do these things. The Defense Acquisition System cannot operate properly unless it has good interaction with two other major defense support systems, and those are planning, programming, budgeting, and execution, which is how we get our money, and the Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System, which is where the users, the warfighters, document their requirements or their capability needs. So we're not going to start a program unless we have a capability need, and we're not going to have a program unless we have money. So we have to make these things work together, and it's not an easy thing because PPBE tends to be driven by the calendar. It's a once a year process that we go through to budget money for programs and program money in the out years as well. Now the JSID system tends to be need driven. Needs are coming up all the time, so uh, it has its own pace. Our defense acquisition system is an event driven system. We want to get whatever we need in terms of data, in terms of testing, in terms of design ready for a milestone decision authority to have confidence in that next decision so we can go on to the next phase. So making something that's event driven work with something that's need driven and work with something that's calendar driven tends to be a big challenge in acquisition. You're going to see these interactions as we go through the phases here. These are the five phases. We start with material solution analysis, which means we're picking the most promising technology to meet that user need that was expressed in the initial capabilities document here. Then in technology maturation and risk reduction, we're going to reduce the risk by proving that technology through competitive prototyping, making sure that it works. Okay, And then in engineering and manufacturing development, we're going to complete the build to design. This is the one that we're actually going to field. And then we're going to build a few of those to prove that the design works and that we can actually manufacture or produce that design. Then in production deployment, we're going to produce a limited amount. We're going to test those to make sure that they work. And then we're going to produce the rest of the full buy and get to full operational capability. In the meantime, as we are fielding these, we're going to have to go into the next phase, which is operations and support, where we are going to support all of the units that are out there for the full life of the system. And then at the end of that phase, we will dispose of the system properly. So that's just a quick walkthrough of the general flow of the five phases. Now we're going to get into each of the phases and talk about some of the details. All right, our first phase is material solution analysis. And remember that we're kicking that off with an initial capabilities document. That is what the user provides. It says that we have this warfighting capability that's missing in order to defend the nation. In addition to the initial capabilities document, in order to enter this phase, we've got to have a plan. We've got to have guidance for how we're going to do our analysis to pick the best technology, that analysis of alternatives. And we also have to have an approved plan for how that AOA is going to be done, who, who's actually going to do it, and those kinds of things. During this phase, some major activities here are establishing a program office and a program manager. You've got to have people to do all this work that's going to happen in the phase, so that's got to happen first. Then we're going to conduct the AOA, and the PM and the Program Management Office will oversee that. They won't do it because it typically happens outside the organization. And then within the organization, we are going to be developing the major program documentation that we need for the next milestone. And this is kind of typical of all of the phases. As we're going through here, we're doing the analysis, the design, the testing, whatever it happens to be that's the main effort. And we're also planning for that next phase. In this case, our acquisition strategy is at plan for the next phase. During this phase, we need to interact with our users quite a bit for the JSID system to work properly. They're going to provide us with a draft capability document right here towards the end of the phase, and that informs our acquisition strategy. Got to know a little more hard requirements in order to plan how we're going to mature them in the next phase. We also need money. This is new. We have to establish full funding by Milestone A, and that is a fairly long process because only once a year do you have an opportunity to get into the budget and the program for the out years. So that's something you really got to pay attention to here in material solution analysis now. Once we have picked a technology, we've got that approved AOA, uh, we've got an acquisition strategy and the other program documentation that's necessary, then we are ready for a Milestone A decision to get us to the next phase. 
The next phase is technology maturation and risk reduction, and that's a new name. It used to be technology development. Now, technology maturation and risk reduction is just what it says. We are maturing the technology and reducing the program risks, and generally speaking, that's through competitive prototyping. To get that milestone A, as I just said, you need an approved material solution. What's the best technology to go forward with? We need initial major program documentation, like our test evaluation master plan, and those others that were listed there. And we need that full funding in the future year's defense program. There's a lot going on in this phase. In order to get to the point where we are comfortable with our technology, you're doing that competitive prototyping, uh, if it makes sense uh, finance-wise to do that. And we're also doing some very serious systems engineering trade-off analysis. And that is cost performance trades, generally speaking. And that informs our JSIDS process. So we need to tell our users what's affordable. Okay, so we need to have that dialogue uh, so that when we get those capabilities finally um, written down and approved in the CDD or capability development document, that that is something that we can actually afford within the context of, of the Department of Defense and for the program. And it's also feasible technically. In other words, it's something we can do. Um, and part of that is just looking at how things are going in terms of maturing the technology. Is it really feasible or not? And then we've got this big decision here. After the CDD is validated by the user, we've got this big decision called a development request for proposals release decision, or a DRFPRD. That is new, and that does just what the acronym says. It gives us permission to release a request for proposals. So as we're going along, we've got to put together that contracting strategy that allows us to get that permission, as well as updating most of our major program documentation there. This is considered by our leadership to be the key decision in the overall life cycle of the program. And the reason that is is because once you put that out in writing in terms of your requirements for the program that's going to go into a contract eventually, there's not a lot you can do to make major changes in that without major perturbations in your program. So it has a lot of momentum once you make this decision and put that request for proposals out on the street. Financially, lots going on as well. We've got to manage our funds execution now. We've got to manage uh, how we are obligating and expending our funds. And we also have to make sure that we have full funding for the program in the out years when we hit milestone B, so that we're in that future year's defense program again. Once we have matured our technology and retired the program risk to an adequate level, we're ready for a milestone B in the next phase. The next phase being engineering and manufacturing development. This phase is going to get us ready to produce the system. So to enter, once again, we've got to adequately reduce those program risks. We've got to get approved requirements. That CDD has to be approved. And we've got to get the full funding. Lots of activities going on. This is kind of broken up into, into two major things that we do. First, we're going to complete our detailed integrated design uh, for the system. And that's going to get us ready for a system level critical design review. That's one of the two design reviews that are mandatory on the program. And you'll notice here this PDR, which actually uh, should be completed in the previous phase, has got a question mark. If you were starting at milestone B, you would need to do your preliminary design review after milestone B. But normally speaking, without a waiver, you need to do that in the previous phase. So we're getting ready. We're doing our final design, getting a final build to design uh, so that we can do a critical design review and establish that product baseline. And that's a pretty big deal because then we're going to demonstrate that that design that we've got is manufacturable by building a few of them. And then we're going to demonstrate that those prototypes that we just built actually work. We're going to do some very robust developmental and operational testing to prove that we should be going to production at milestone C. We also have to prove interoperability, supportability, all those things of system performance. JSIDs. We'll be refining the requirements. Our users, again, we need to have a dialogue with them to make sure that we capture any lessons learned through the development and design of the system. And so they will update the capability development document into a capability production document, which has to be signed and approved prior to milestone C. We've got to com 
continue to manage our funds and make sure that we have full funding for the production and support of the system as we go forward into the next phase. Next phase is production and deployment. Again, very descriptive in terms of what we're doing. We're going to start producing in a low amount there, low rate initial production in order to get in here. Just what we talked about in the previous phase, good performance in your DT and, and operational assessments that tells us that the system works, that our manufacturing processes are ready to go, and that we've got acceptable performance in all those other areas. Major activities, we've got low rate initial production that I talked about, and that does a couple of things for us. We can build up to 10% of our full buy and low rate initial production. That establishes the production base for us, and it also gives us test articles for that big final exam called Initial Operational Test and Evaluation, or IOT&E. Along with IOT&E, we also have to do live fire test and evaluation, if that's applicable to our program, and we have to do the final interoperability testing of the system as well. If all of that goes well, then we're ready for a full rate production decision review, and that gives us the permission to produce the rest of the systems, which may take years. And while that's happening, we still got to support the system, which is the next phase. That's why we have a big overlap between these phases here. Once we've got everything deployed and it's ready to go to war, that's full operational capability. Generally speaking, the user will define a small set, uh, usually a unit's worth of equipment that is good enough for initial operational capability. So once we have that unit equipped, trained, and ready to go to war, that's initial operational capability. Once everything's out there, it's full operational capability. And in the meantime, we're going to be supporting the system in the next phase. Our users are going to help us as we go through this and, and get the system out there and we get feedback from our logistic systems and that kind of thing to refine the requirements for support. But we will not have a new capability document at this point. That capability production document that we get right back there at uh, Milestone C is really the last time that they'll formally go through the JSIDS process. In PPBE, we're still going to be managing our funds execution, making sure that we're in those out years as well. Operations and support is our final and longest phase and most expensive. To get into that, we've got to have that approved capability production document and approved life cycle sustainment plan, and we've got to have a successful full rate production decision. Major activities. It's implementing that sustainment plan that we came up with, and that's done through a philosophy of performance-based lifecycle support, or PBL. And that's basically where we incentivize our support organizations within the government and our contractors that support us to provide us with better performance for the warfighter, meaning better reliability, quicker turnaround times, quicker repairs. And so that's the philosophy that we're using now to make sure that we have more uptime and less downtime for our systems and that we do it affordably. At the end of this life cycle, we have to dispose of the system and we have to, just like our support for the system and the reliability, all of that has to be designed in earlier. So way back in the TMRR phase, you've got to be considering support, you've got to be considering disposal and designing the ways that you're going to do that into the system. Within JSEDS, again, our users are going to be helping us through the different feedback systems that we have with logistics to refine uh, the supportability goals and to help us drive costs down for supporting the system. And we've got to continue to maintain execution of our funding and maintain our funding in the future year's defense program as well as look out and see where we need to start putting in the funding for disposal if that's going to cost us more at the end of the program. We've got to make sure when we do that disposal that we consider the environment and safety uh, as well because most of our systems that we build in the Department of Defense tend to be hazardous. So this was a quick overview of the five phases of the, of the defense acquisition system. I hope you learned something from it. I hope you'll take advantage of other videos that we have that will get into more details in each of the phases. Thank you for listening.